So, that is a that is a fundamental question one has to answer which says that if you are in modern day world going to write programs which will operate according to the algorithms that you are putting into those programs, how can they be doing meaningful things essentially. So, it is roughly equivalent to that essentially or I might say that if I were to implement a neural network uh, which is uh, I know that the structure of a neuron how it operates and so on and so forth and I am just connecting together hundreds of thousands of neurons, how can that ever do meaningful things like character recognition. Of course, we know that it can be done character recognition can be done, but the fundamental question is that is it intelligent or is it some doing something that we have asked it to do. In fact, Ada Lovelace had said that the computer can only do what it is instructed to do and nothing more than that, which is of course, true at a very fundamental level. So, some recent thoughts on who is doing this manipulation of thinking. There are some very interesting books and for those of you who are interested, I would recommend them. All of three have a common author called Douglas Hofstadter, who is in the Indiana University. His famous book called Godel Escher Bach and uh, he and Dennett wrote a series of collected a series of articles called the Minds I and more recently he's written a book called I am a strange loop essentially. So, he's trying to Hofstadter is also trying to answer this question. I mean instead of saying who he is saying what is this notion of I that I have as a as a human being that I have essentially hmm. or I or you essentially. So, if I talk of you as a person, what do I really mean? What is that you essentially? So, I say that my body, my mind, my hands, my eyes, my feet, my whatever. What is this I which is saying my essentially? That is a question which Hofstadter is trying to answer and he sort of uses a combination of emergent behavior and self referential loops which we do not have time to get into here essentially, but I would recommend one of these books they are quite easy to read and quite engrossing. Okay, so, let us move on from Descartes, so John Locke known as the father of classical liberalism. His theory of mind is often cited as the origin of modern concept of identity and the self essentially and it influence other philosophers like Hume that we will see and Kant that we will see in a moment. He postulated that mind was a blank slate as opposed to what Chomsky says that we are born with an inbuilt grammar called the universal grammar in our heads. Locke said that the mind was a blank state or tabula rasa as he called it and that we are born without innate ideas and as you can see in the last two lines that knowledge is determined by experience derived from sense perception that whatever we know in our heads is the result of whatever we have experienced in the world and experience leads to knowledge essentially. So, one of his uh, collaborators followers David Hume Scottish philosopher whom Hogeland calls as a mental mechanic and by this we mean a mechanic who is operating in the mental domain. He was an empiricist and in his book called the treatise of human nature, he strove to create what he called as a science of man that examined the psychological basis of human nature. He said that everything is tied up to human nature. If you can understand human nature, you can understand how human beings behave and what else is there essentially. So, science and everything derives from that. He follows this idea of experience and observation as the foundation of logical argument and he was an admirer of Newton. And he says in a manner in which Newton expressed the mo movement of heavenly bodies over planets and so on, he says that impressions and ideas are like basic particles to which mental forces and operations are applied. Just as Newton is giving the laws of physics, Hume, in, Hume is saying that there is a law of mental activity, law of associations as he called it, that there were mental ideas were like particles, he is not saying that they were particles, he is saying they are like particles to which mental forces and operations are applied. Further like Newton he does not care 
as to how that is happening. So, Newton never explains how gravity happens or you know why gravity happens and you know there is no explanation behind there. He just gives the laws of gravity and says that this is how planets are moving around the earth and it is explained by gravity. So, Hume does the same thing, he does not try to explain how it is happening, he says this is what is happening and it can be explained by this laws, do not ask me why it is happening like that. But he could not explain however, what made ideas ideas now. You know, it is like that once you say these are particles which are obeying these laws, then okay, why are they ideas essentially. Okay? And what makes their interaction between different ideas count as thinking essentially. So, he is done away with the meaning altogether. So, the last person we will visit today is Immanuel Kant, German philosopher widely considered to be central to modern philosophy. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, we had a whole course which did a comparative analysis of Kant and Mill's philosophy. He says, and this is very interesting. So, we have come a long way in this short period of time. From this notion that the world is out there and we are simply seeing the world, you know, the correspondence theory of knowledge and then mind body dualism and then so Kant has come to the other extreme. He says the mind has a priori principles which makes things outside conform to those principles. And these are some very consistent with some very modern ideas essentially. So, for example, some very recent research in computer vision. So, the, the simple view of computer vision would be like the correspondence theory of knowledge that you, you, you get the image of things and you do image processing, pattern recognition, feature extraction, all this kind of stuff and then you understand what is happening. It is a forward process from the world to the mind. Modern theory says that we have preconceived notions of what we are trying to see and what we see is already there in, in our minds to some extent. This is what Kant has said, the mind has a priori principles which make things outside conform to those principles. Then he says the mind shapes and structures experience, it is a mind which shapes structures and experience. So, that on the abstract level all human experience shares essential structural features. So, all our minds operate in the same way that is why we are able to communicate. You know, that is a question that one could have asked, how can you know one human being communicate ideas to another human being essentially. So, he says that fundamentally the mind has a similar structure. Then he of course, goes, to, goes on to explain that the concept of space and time are integral to human ex experience that you cannot operate without them as are the notions of cause and effect essentially. So, how, what causes what? Causal co theory is basically a mental theory. I mean, in the real world, I mean we have this cause and effect kind of a notion that if I turn a switch on the light will come on, but the physics does not recognize any cause causal theory. The physics only recognizes equations. So, it goes from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state. There is no causal things, but they, these are fundamental to our thinking essentially. So, the, the second last paragraph is, is very interesting. He says that we do not have direct experience of things and we will visit this in the next class which we have on Wednesday. We will come back to this question of the, the, the as he calls it the, the nominal world or the real world outside. We do not have direct experience access to the real world, but what we do experience is the phenomenal world as conveyed by our senses. So, we cannot, now this is a very philosophical question. And if you look at some Indian philosophies like Buddhism, they ask the same question again essentially that what is there in the mind is what we think is out there essentially. That is what Kant is saying essentially. And he says that human concepts and categories structure the view of the world as we see it essentially. So, the world is not as, as it is out there, but as we see it essentially, so, the world as we know it essentially. So, this is known as the subject object problem essentially, a long standing philosophical issue is concerned with analysis of human experience. So, the question is that the world consists of objects and entities which are perceived or otherwise presumed to exist as entities by subjects essentially. So, there is a subject, so we think that the world has this objects out there and how does that happen essentially. Okay, so, some technical terms which we 
should be familiar with. So, the subject object problem has two, two primary aspects. First is what is known, what can exist out there and this is something that we call as ontology. It become very popular in current day computer science. So, the field of ontology deals with questions concerning what exists or what can be can said to be exists essentially and how such entities are grouped together essentially related within a hierarchy and that kind of a thing. So, nowadays computer scientists talk a lot about ontologies and the, in the concept of the semantic webs. So, we have want computers to talk to another one computer sitting here to meaningfully talk to another computer and we have this notion of ontologies and taxonomies uh, which we may not have time to go through in this course. The second standpoint is how does one know what we know essentially and this concerns epistemology questions as to how knowledge is acquired. Okay. So, ontology says what can exist and epistemology is concerned with how do we get the real facts of for example, why was Durga suspended? Epistemic question, how do we say that this is what is really happened out there essentially. So, that is the question of knowledge acquisition or epistemology and the bounds of our own mind. So, he create, so Kant says that he has done something like a Copernican revolution in philosophy. So, what he calls as critical philosophy. So, he says there are two things, one is the epistemology of transcendental idealism which says that we are not able to transcend the bounds of our own mind. We can only perceive the world through the prism of our mind in some sense or through the spectacles or glasses of our mind and we cannot exceed that. So, we cannot access the real world out there, only what our mind allows us to see. So, already the notion of mind has become so prominent essentially. And the moral philosophy, the moral philosophy in those days was not quite what we talk about it as right now, but something to do with the mental world, the moral philosophy of the autonomy of practical reason. He says that you know practical reason can be automated. So, maybe this is the last thing I will leave you with. Conceptual unification and integration is carried out by the mind through concepts or the categories of understanding. So, this is again those terms from ontologies are coming up. We have concepts about things. We know we have categories of birds and you know flowers and apple and fruits and all these kind of categories are things. Operational on the perceptual manifold which is built within space and time. We say space and time is something fundamental to our minds. Our minds think in terms of space and time and everything that we think about is located within the notion, our notions of space and time. They are not concepts, but are forms that are a priori necessary conditions for any possible experience. He says that without this notion of say space and time, we would not have been able to imagine the world and think about the world. Thus, the objective order of nature and the causal necessity that operates within it are dependent upon the mind's processes, okay, which he called by a product of a rule based activity, which he called as a synthesis. So, the emphasis has totally shifted to the human mind. It is a human mind which shapes the way we see the world and we reason about the world and everything is dependent upon that. Okay. So, from a notion when we, we did not even have a notion of a mind and then gradually we said thought and reality is different and then mind body is different. Kant has come taken us to a point which says that our interaction with the world is controlled by our mind essentially. So, this is what we will do in the next class. Just to remind you of the goal that Hogeland that we have set. The goal of AI is to build a machine with a mind of its own. So, in the next class we will come back to this Kantian view of the mind and discuss a little bit more and maybe wind up with the introduction in the on next Wednesday.